Good afternoon. My name is Tanya Winders, the President and CEO of Allergy and Asthma Network, and I welcome you to our 2021 Hill Brief webcast as a portion of our virtual Allergy Asthma Day on Capitol Hill 2021, aka AADCH. This event is an annual event hosted by Allergy and Asthma Network alongside the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. And it's our pleasure to host you once again today. To participate in our virtual advocacy day activities and week activities, please visit aadch.org or allergyasthmanetwork.org for more information. As I said, I'd like to acknowledge the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, ACAAI, and our other sponsors who have made today possible. We greatly appreciate your continued support. We have over 300 attendees participating in the webcast today, and many more who will be taking part in our virtual ADCH events this week. We greatly appreciate your willingness to participate in so many different ways. We must remain diligent in raising awareness of issues that impact the greater than 60 million Americans living with allergies, asthma, and related conditions. And we must continue to engage policymakers to move our message forward. In these unprecedented times, I am honored to continue to lead and work alongside the dedicated group of individuals at Allergy and Asthma Network. I wanna thank especially our Federal Director of Advocacy, Charmaine Anderson, and State Advocacy Lead, Kelly Barta, for all of their work in organizing today's events. Again, at Allergy and Asthma Network, we have been committed to the same mission of ending needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions through our four mission areas of outreach, education, advocacy, and research. You'll hear more about some of those programs today, but also you'll hear from leaders in the patient community, in the healthcare professional community, and from our federal government agencies on how we are working together to accomplish this mission each and every day. So with that, let's get to our program. Our 2021 policy priorities include the five things that are highlighted here on this slide. And again, throughout the program today, you'll hear a great deal about these. How can we work together to improve access to medical care and treatment? to continue to ensure asthma and allergy program funding for those federal programs that I spoke about. Also to reduce health risk for those that are living with allergy and asthma, especially in the emergency events that sometimes occur when you are living with these chronic conditions. Next, how can we mitigate environmental health hazards? We know that climate change is happening, we know that air quality is worsening. And so how, again, can we continue to elevate policies to ensure that we can breathe easier? And then finally, 2021 ADCH would not be complete without a, a policy initiative and focus on COVID-19 prevention and treatment. And so we'll spend the latter half of our program today focused on some of the efforts that we have in this particular area. First up, we have the opportunity and the honor and privilege to hear from our Allergy and Asthma Caucus leadership. So first, I'm going to invite Debbie Dingle, Representative Debbie Dingle, to the podium. Representative Dingle, please take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to be with you today. I'm Congresswoman Debbie Dingle from the great state of Michigan. And I'm also co-chair of the Asthma and Allergy Caucus. And it's really an honor to be with all of you today for your day on the Hill. And I hope next year I'm with you in person because I don't know about you, I'm getting tired of virtual, but it's still a great way to connect. And it's really important what you're doing today. 
it is very clear that we need to continue to raise awareness for the millions of people that are living with asthma and allergies. We know that about 25 million Americans are living with asthma, including 5.1 million children under the age of 18. And that over 50 million people in the US suffer from allergies and it's prime allergy season right now with the pollen count. And that's why your meetings this week are so important and that the work of the Congressional Asthma and Allergy Caucus is so important. Our goal is to work with and build on the work of the organizations like the Allergy and Asthma Network that bring together members of Congress, staff, the medical community, and patients themselves, advocates, those that suffer from this, and the public to raise awareness about the issues, to secure funding for critical research and development of new drugs, and improve the lives of adults and children who are living with these conditions. And that's why this month, I've had a few appropriation bills, it's appropriation season, that have put requests in on behalf of people living with asthma and allergies, including requesting 20, $35 million for CDC's National Asthma Control Program for the fiscal year 2022, and additional funding for the Federal Food Allergy Research at NIH. This conference will help to foster meaningful conversations as we learn about the latest research and promote awareness of the health and economic concerns associated with asthma and severe allergies and what Congress needs to do in this space. And I'll tell you something else, unscripted, un, we need to talk about the cost of what an inhaler is. You know, last year, right before the pandemic, I met a mother who's living below the poverty line. She's working two jobs and she has a child with asthma. She doesn't have the health insurance she needs. And that inhaler costs her $800 a month. We need to make sure that children who are suffering from asthma, adults that are suffering from asthma and allergies have access to the medicine that gives them a quality of life, helps them breathe. So thank you so much for the advocacy work you are doing. It means so much to not only all of you who are here, but to the millions of people across this country that are living with asthma and allergy. And don't forget that if we work together, we get those collective voices, we can make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Dingell. Now we are going to have the privilege of hearing from our Democratic lead, Representative Fred Upton. Representative Upton. Well, I'm Congressman Fred Upton, and I'm so sorry that I can't be with you in person. I'm so sorry that none of us are maybe there in person as we endure this uh, pandemic for the last uh, 14 months now, uh, for sure. But I just want to tell you that your advocacy is so important. So I'm a Republican congressman from Southwest Michigan. That's where I am now. Now and the sun's out. I can see Lake Michigan uh, across the street to my right. But I can tell you that I have been on the health subcommittee since 1991. And this is, uh, it, it is so unfortunate that we don't have the huge gathering of folks uh, that traditionally come that first week in May to visit with their members of Congress, uh, Republican and Democrat, both sides of the Capitol, as you really do the right thing and encourage us to bend the arms of those that may not be with us, perhaps, on this issue, to get on board and to make sure that we have those important research dollars so that it will make your life easier and maybe even save your life. So a number of years ago, I was the chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee. And in that six years, we passed major bipartisan legislation that President Obama signed into law. In fact, more than 200 bills, but among the best one that we did was this bill called 21st Century Cures, a bill to speed up, expedite the approvals of drugs and devices 
was coupled with $45 billion in additional research money for the NIH and it was paid for, something that Speaker Paul Ryan insisted on and we did it, but it passed overwhelmingly, 392 to 26 uh, and 92 to eight in the Senate. We're now working on the next version of that. It's called Cures 2.0. And my partner, Diana Deget, a Democrat from Denver, she and I did the first package through. We're now working on the second one. We're hoping to build on that so that we can solve these diseases that impact, let's face it, every family, not only here in America, but obviously around the world. Now, I'm also co-chair today of the Asthma and Allergy Caucus. And our, we advocate for policies and legislation that literally will support the 25 million adults in this country that live with asthma, 15 million living with allergies, another 6 million with kids. This is a serious health threat. And it's made even more serious with today's pandemic that we're all enduring. In my state of Michigan, more than 750,000 adults, so actually 780,000 adults, live with asthma, which disproportionately affects the minority communities and obviously those living in poverty too. And you know the number, this respiratory disease uh, takes a significant toll on our economy. In fact, it costs the U.S. nearly $82 billion each year, including the indirect costs in the form of missed days of school and work. So in the last Congress, we introduced the bipartisan Family Asthma Act for really important legislation that's going to expand federal, state, and local effects efforts to improve the, uh, the way of life for, obviously, for individuals with asthma. So the work that you do this week as the Allergy and Asthma Network you know, that you're, uh, is critical as we fight together to improve conditions for patients suffering from these ailments. I've got your back. We've got to work together because together, not only will we find a cure, uh, but in the meantime, we'll make it a lot easier, I hope, for all American families as we deal with this. In divided, in these, these days of divided government, 50-50 Senate, a House that's pretty closely uh, aligned between Republicans and Democrats, the only way you get things done is on a bipartisan basis. I'm committed to do that. And that's why I'm delighted to be part of this caucus and be the Republican co-chair. God bless all of you. And we hope to see you in person next year. I promise. Bye. Thank you so much, Representative uh, Upton and, and also the Honorable Debbie Dingell. Uh, again, it's so wonderful to have that bipartisan leadership from Democrat Debbie Dingell and from Republican Fred Upton. Uh, they are actually leading the efforts as we go out and rebuild the Allergy and Asthma Caucus in this 117th Congress. And we are so grateful for their continued leadership and for advancing so many of the efforts and policies that we'll discuss today. Now I'm honored to invite to the podium Dr. Luz Bonashir, the current president of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. She is going to bring us up to date with the 2021 State of Allergy and Asthma Report. Hi, I'm Luz Wanashir, President of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and I'm here to discuss the current state of allergy and asthma in the United States. Despite advances in the diagnosis and treatment, allergies and asthma can be life-threatening. And even if asthma and allergies are not life-threatening, they can have profound effect on the patient's daily life. Environmental changes are likely to increase in the near future and make life more difficult for people with allergies and asthma. There's climate change, pollution, and urban crowding. As our population become more diverse, we need to understand how these conditions play out with patients of varying backgrounds. COVID-19 creates added uncertainty for patients with these conditions. The economic realities of healthcare put pressure on our ability to provide care for all who need it. 
So let's talk about asthma. 25 million Americans are diagnosed with asthma. One in 10 children have asthma. And there's an annual cost of $80 billion. There's over 3,000 deaths annually and 75% higher in black persons than white persons. In children, this is the most common reason why kids miss school. And they 13.8 million children miss school days per year. 14.2 million adults miss work days per year. Three to five asthmatics have limited physical activity and 71% misuse their inhalers. More importantly though, one in five cannot afford their medications. What about environmental allergies? One to five Americans are diagnosed with environmental allergies and 4 million missed work days per year has been reported with $8 billion of annual costs. And more than 50% of people with environmental allergies say that it impacts their daily quality of life. Two thirds of asthmatic patients actually have environmental allergies. If one parent have allergies, their children have 50% more likely to have allergies as well. And if both parents are allergic, their children have 75% more likely to have allergies. Allergies are due to environmental factors, which includes pollen, dust mite, mold, animal danders, and poor air quality. They can manifest as itchy, watery eyes, rash, itching, runny nose, sneezing, and just feeling tired. Allergies can be life-threatening. One in 12 children have food allergies. $24.8 billion is the annual cost of food allergies. 29% of children have food allergies and asthma, and 25% of food allergic reactions occur in students without a previous diagnosis. They have a great burden on fatality, about 150 to 200 fatalities per year from food allergies, 40 fatalities from insecting, 400 per year due to medication allergy, and one to 6% of Americans have latex allergy. There are recent innovations and understanding that asthma is a spectrum rather than a single disease is important. Identifying allergy and asthma phenotypes, allowing work on precision medicine treatments for the future. There are treatment innovations that have been approved, novel targeted asthma therapies, new routes of administration of allergen immunotherapy. The first drug for treatment for food allergy has been approved in 2020 and the development of biologics for atopic dermatitis, asthma, and more. There's increased recognition of racial, ethnic, genetic, and environmental differences in disease states among patients. The college led efforts in the COVID-19 uh, epidemic to provide vital information about allergic reactions to COVID-19 vaccines. We created the COVID-19 Vaccine Task Force. We also supported members who have been in the forefront in the fight against COVID-19. We monitored medication shortages, increased risk of asthma, patients from COVID, participation in vaccine development and testing, and provided allergy community with timely information about the pandemic, the disease, its treatment, diagnosis, and prevention. We worked to increase racial disparities and increase healthcare equity in the treatment of patients with allergies and asthma. We have provided grant funding to the college's foundation for practicing grassroots allergies to address health disparities and other challenges related to allergy care within their own communities. We partner with academic programs as well to increase awareness of the specialty among students from diverse backgrounds. We created the Diversity Task Force. We help raise awareness of racial disparities in asthma and allergy outcomes by providing many learning opportunities to keep our members at the cutting edge of knowledge. And we provide more physician education and patient and public information in Spanish. For our members, we have developed an in 
person educational 2021 annual meeting following last year's world-class virtual meeting. We developed timely and practical resources for healthcare professionals and public. We have the anaphylaxis toolkit, yardstick on idiopathic anaphylaxis, and genetic testing for primary immune deficiencies. For our patients, we increase public awareness of the specialty. We increase awareness of our robust patient information and our public website, which currently has more than 600,000 monthly unique visitors. And for our specialty in general, we continue to work collaboratively with lay organizations like the Allergy and Asthma Network. We amplify the college's position as an advocacy leader for the specialty. We promote and publish world-class research to enable better diagnosis and treatment of allergy and asthma, as well as the advanced understanding of immunology. The college will always advocate for patients to have access to specialist care and appropriate treatments. We advocate for continued coverage of telehealth medicine benefits and licensing flexibilities. We advocate for the safest treatment protocols for allergy asthma patients during the pandemic. We supported patients and providers with specific recommendations for the language of the No Surprise Act that aims to minimize surprise bills to patients when their health work healthcare is delivered by providers outside of their insurance network. The college joined other allergy organizations in supporting passage of the FASTER Act, which is great news for our patients with sesame allergy and other food allergies. We look forward to the information that will be collected and reported as part of this law. So I thank you for this opportunity to participate and represent the college in this worthwhile and very important endeavor for our allergy patients. Thank you so much, Dr. Fanashir. Now I'd like to turn the focus to Allergy and Asthma Network's AADCH Key Advocacy Issues for 2021. As I said before, we have five policy priorities that truly filter and shape every single request that comes across our advocacy desk. And this year, we have prioritized the following. First, to improve access to medical care and treatment. We know that we need high quality, affordable health care, as well as health insurance coverage, including Medicare and Medicaid for those in greatest need. In order to do that, though, we also need to address the fraud, waste, and abuse in all areas of health care. Especially in our space, we have seen this consistently in the allergen immunotherapy practices that we need to continue to address and resolve and ensure that our tax dollars and our, doll our healthcare dollars are being utilized most efficiently and effectively. We also need to access innovative therapies and technologies, things like you've already heard about today, biologic, immunotherapy, telehealth, remote patient monitoring. These have all come to the forefront in the last year while care has been delivered primarily in a virtual fashion. But we have to continue to access safe, effective, affordable medications. Again, it's so disturbing to hear those numbers that one in five, 20% cannot afford their chronic care medications in allergy and asthma. And that's why we continue to advocate and support for policies like the changes in the complex generic FDA regulatory approval process. Next, asthma and allergy program funding. It was so wonderful to hear from the Honorable Debbie Dingle about the, the efforts to increase CDC's funding. And we continue to advocate for fiscal year 2022 federal funding for all programs that are relevant for asthma and allergy. Next, we turn our, our attention and focus towards reducing health risks for allergy and asthma emergencies. Again, you heard from Congressman Upton around the School-Based Allergies and Asthma Manage, Management Program Act, which thankfully was passed in the 116th Congress and signed into law in December of 2020. This creates asthma-friendly schools and ensures that all students 
have, who have asthma are um, covered and, and taken care of with that safe and healthy environment. Next, food allergy. We know that we need clear and consistent food labeling that helps us to recognize for any potential allergen cross contact. And the FASTER Act was signed in April of 2021 in this new Congress. And we are so very thankful and excited for the federal decision makers who helped to support and make this happen. Finally, we're continuing to advocate for airline passenger safety. While it does seem like a long way off before we we're flying the friendly skies as we once did prior to pandemic, definitely we believe that we need to continue to see epinephrine as the first line treatment for those that are experiencing anaphylaxis in flight. And that in fact, airlines should carry no fewer than two packs of epinephrine auto injectors and conduct annual crew member training. Now, when we turn towards our environmental health hazards and mitigating those health hazards, we believe that people with asthma and other respiratory illnesses like COPD are certainly more vulnerable, air pollution and adverse health effects of climate change. So we want to continue to push for policies that prioritize the federal investment in climate and health preparedness. And then finally, as I said before, we could not have an AADCH 2021 without focusing in for just a moment on COVID-19 prevention and treatment. And so the advocacy issues that we are taking to the Hill with the hundreds of advocates this week are to also focus on continued prevention and testing for COVID-19 for those living with chronic respiratory conditions and allergy and compromised immune uh, systems. And then secondly, to continue to support funding for healthcare providers, medication access, treatment access, vaccination access, and to ensure that testing and reporting is especially available for those in our minority communities and our most vulnerable populations. Because we know that unfortunately, health inequities continue to exist here in our country. We continue to also do this at the state advocacy level. While today and this week we're focused on our federal allergy asthma day on Capitol Hill, we have a number of bills that are moving through state legislatures. And these are a few of the, the bills and the topics that those bills cover. So truly from state capitals to our voices here on Capitol Hill, we are advocating day in, day out for those 60 million Americans living with allergies and asthma. And now I'm honored to actually bring to the podium the Nelson family and have them share their voice of their patient journey, but also how they've come to DC, as you can see here in this picture, to actually host meetings and to share with their federal decision makers the importance of allergy and asthma advocacy. Hi, everybody. We're very happy to be with you today for this portion of Capitol Hill Day. We hope you're having a great time. Um, as you can see from the slide, I'm Wayne Nelson. This is my wife, Rhonda Nelson. She is the, the AERD patient. Um, and uh, the folks have asked us to tell our story. It's, it's kind of unique. Um, I'll start off by saying that Little River Band is responsible for us being together because we met at a show in Nashville in 1999 and fast forward to where this story begins on new year's eve of 2000 we were going to play a show Rhonda was going to come with us we were in san diego and her cold and sinus symptoms were so severe that she couldn't go and i say that because she desperately wanted to um given that it was the the, the turn of the century and so on and so forth and so this was a uh, um a situation that we immediately became aware of uh, that was so severe that she couldn't attend even a concert. And um, that's where it all began. And, and it, it sent us on a path of trying to figure out why these sinus infections were recurring. And um, that's the beginning. I wanna turn it over to uh, the patient here and, and let her explain a little more of how we go and as we've done this in the past, um, 
thoughts come to me about being on the road and being on tour, which does make our situation very unique. So um, introducing Rhonda Nelson to everybody. Thanks everybody for listening to our story. Um, like Wayne said, this began for me back in uh, 2001 and it started out as what we thought was a cold. And I think that is one of the things that is so frustrating for AERD patients. Um, oftentimes this goes uh, misdiagnosed or undiagnosed more, more appropriately, sometimes for years. Um, we're hearing that a lot from patients uh, literally all over the world. Um, it did take quite a while for us to receive an actual diagnosis. It was about a year and a half, I think, just fortunately, uh, by the grace of God, that we found a doctor who had just recently returned um, from an organization and a conference on AERD. Back then, it was known as Samter's Triad, and um, put us on a path to figuring out how to control this disease. I think one of the things that's that Wayne and I have found so frustrating throughout the time uh, from diagnosis to current day, even though I am very well maintained at this point, is that from the outside, we patients look like everyone else. We look normal. We don't look sick. We hear that a lot. You don't look sick. Um, However, um, if the disease is not well controlled, as mine was for many, many years, um, you will have a flare and sometimes you have no idea what sets that off. Um, most commonly, people realize that AERD patients are allergic to aspirin and NSAIDs. So while it may seem simple to stay away from those uh, drugs, it's not always that easy because there are other things that create um, flares or reactions within our bodies that can be life-threatening. What Wayne and I have learned through throughout this journey is that it is absolutely important that you as a patient, myself as a patient, understand the importance of being your own advocate with your healthcare professionals. Um, that's part of the reason we are together uh, with Allergy and Asthma Network in that we and they are such supporters of being a, a, a patient advocate and getting the word out about this disease. And I can tell you that while AERD does complicate our lives a little bit. Um, it, it doesn't keep us from doing the things that we enjoy or traveling to the places we enjoy. It just alters the way we do them. And I think one of the things that Wayne mentioned about um, what we think about when we're speaking about this particular subject, um, we, we remember times when before a proper diagnosis was found, uh, life-threatening instances when we were on the road. And I can tell you for many years when I would travel with Wayne on the road, the very first thing we would look for in a town was the hospital. And um, we needed to know where that hospital was just in case. And um, I will say that through the years, there's been great advancements, not only in the understanding of the disease, but in the treatment of the disease. And there's been great um, uh, advances made with medications where we can be very well controlled. But again, it all goes back to finding the right physicians, finding a team that understands you and understands this disease, and then going on a path of finding the correct medications that work for you. Um, while she was mentioning that, one of the one of the unique circumstances where we did find ourselves heading to the emergency room late at night, we were in Minneapolis. We had had a great day together. It was uh, kind of a spring day 
and there were no signs of of any kind of flare. We walked back into our room and the air conditioning had kicked itself on after housekeeping was there. And within minutes, Rhonda started to seize up. There was something in the air conditioner that was putting probably mold into the air or something, whatever it was. But the the hotel knew that it was the band that was there and, and so on and so forth. So I called the front desk and I said, who would we talk to to get uh, an, an, an EMT to come to pick us up and take us to the hospital? This is drastic. She's having a, a asthmatic attack. And so they called, the EMTs came, they wheeled us, they wheeled her down to the to the vehicle. And I got in the front seat and they put Rhonda in the back seat. And for the next 20 minutes on the way to the emergency room, each of us was being grilled by the paramedics as to, okay, we know that you guys are with a band. What drugs have you been taking? And what is it that's really going on here that's caused this uh, situation to arise? And we kept we kept getting more and more furious. We just came from dinner. We, we don't do drugs. We are stone cold sober. And this is an asthmatic reaction to something in the room, something in the air, and they just would not have it. And she was then immediately rushed into emergency and this flare was bad enough. She was hooked up to an IV for five hours to get her heart rate and her breathing back to normal. It was probably one of the most severe that we had ever experienced. We've, we've made that rush to the emergency five times, but that one, everybody experiences that that panic and that that feeling but it's exacerbated when you're on the road and you don't have a car and you have no idea where you're going and then on top of that you get accused of being drug druggies while you're in the EMT it was it was quite an evening i think that's um one of the reasons that we are so passionate about uh, uh collaborating with an organization such as Allergy Asthma Network to just give our lend our voices to share our experience like that and also to get the word out there about AERD, about being your own advocate, and about raising our voices to let it be heard about how difficult it is for some patients to obtain the proper medications for this particular disease. The medications are quite expensive. There's a lot of hassles with insurance and there doesn't need to be. So we are so grateful for the opportunity to work closely with Allergy and Asthma Network and to be able to have days like this where we can share our story, where we can talk to our representatives, our state representatives and, and also when we're home, our local representatives, and let our voices be heard, not only for ourselves, but for all of the patients out there. We really appreciate the opportunity to share our story with you, and we so appreciate you guys joining in for Allergy and Asthma Network Day, Capitol Hill 2021. Have a great day, everybody, and take good care. We will see you soon. Thank you so much, Wayne and Rhonda. It, such a powerful message from you two about the way that, again, Rhonda's disease, a rare disease that mimics severe asthma, AERD, asthma exacerbated respiratory disease, um, has impacted their life. And, and they are wonderful advocates. And again, if you're going to participate with us in the, the events of Allergy Asthma Day Capitol Hill today and tomorrow, we hope that you'll come back and join us tomorrow evening for our um, Little River Band live stream event. Uh, Wayne and Rhonda have been so generous to continue to help support the network and to advance our mission and move forward. And again, we're looking forward to celebrating together virtually tomorrow night. I can't wait till we're back in person together as well. So now for the latter half of our program, we want to turn the focus even more specifically towards the, the spotlight that COVID-19 has placed on health disparities and the reinforcement of the importance of trust. You know, never before in the history of our country and our world have we been so focused on respiratory health 
as in the last 13, 14 months of the COVID-19 pandemic. It truly has provided significant opportunity for us to realize the importance of breathing, the importance of healthy lungs. And we believe that this week, if Allergy and Asthma Day on Capitol Hill and the efforts that will continue after this week will continue to advance and, and put that uh, emphasis and priority needed on lung health. And so as we turn the focus of this portion of the program, we're actually going to hear first from the Environmental Protection Agency. We know that the EPA is doing a lot to mitigate those environmental health hazards as we spoke about before, and also to address climate change. But what you may not be aware of is some of the specific work that they're doing in health disparities. So now I'm going to invite to the podium um, a, a bit, uh, in just a moment, the deputy director from the EPA. But I did wanna share some of these statistics. I'm sorry, I forgot about this one. I added it in last minute. Um, you know, when we talk about COVID-19, we know that Blacks and Latinos are at least two to three times more likely to die from COVID-19. We also know that unfortunately, Blacks are, are less willing to be vaccinated. And again, we've seen some significant improvement here over the last few months in these numbers and leveling out, but there still is a gap between those that are in the white population versus those that are in the black population and their willingness to be vaccinated. And so we know that again, throughout the pandemic, the spotlight has been shown on the health inequities and the disparities. And as I said, I, this quote from the Times of October certainly shows us that even in that recruitment of volunteers for vaccine trials, that we've seen the severe mistrust that continues to plague our nation. The severe mistrust of federal government but also the heightened awareness of just racial, racial injustices. And this is a formidable task that we at Allergy and Asthma Network are committed to. And so you're gonna hear about one of our programs in just a moment, the Not One More Life Trusted Messengers. But before that, I do wanna focus on the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and some of the work that they're doing specifically to address disparities. So I'm going to invite Alejandro Nunez, the Deputy Assistant Administrator, for mobile sources in the Office of Air and Radiation from the EPA. Alejandro? I am pleased to have this opportunity to join the panel today and to represent the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency as we shine a spotlight on the state of asthma in the United States with a particular focus on health equity and environmental justice. Every day, science teaches us more about the ways our health is determined, for better or worse, by our environments, the places where we live and work, the air we breathe, and the activities we do each day. EPA has been at the forefront of developing this science, including for asthma. The demographics of who suffers from asthma in this country are a clear example, not just of how environmental quality can impact health, but also of inequities in health outcomes and the disproportionate environmental burden of disease that often faces low-income communities, people of color, and children. Asthma prevalence and severity remains particularly high among communities of color and children living in poverty and poor housing conditions. These are also the children and adults who end up in the hospital because their asthma is poorly controlled or out of control. Disproportionate burden is also evident in access to healthcare and cost of care, all of which tend to be worse for low income and communities of color. These same disparities or disadvantages in health status and outcomes that reflect social, racial and economic inequities also reflect differences in environmental quality from indoor and outdoor air, the built environment, water quality, and other environmental factors. Communities with the worst asthma outcomes are the same communities with high exposure to environmental pollutants, and evidence that more harmful environmental exposures occur in communities with the worst asthma outcomes is well established. 
I would like to provide an overview of EPA's efforts to reduce the burden of asthma, particularly from poor indoor air quality. EPA works on multiple fronts to reduce harmful environmental exposures that can cause or exacerbate asthma. I also want to highlight the important work that EPA is doing to promote innovative healthcare solutions for indoor air quality, because the indoor environment is now widely recognized as a cause and trigger of asthma. Common environmental hazards found indoors, such as moisture, mold, secondhand smoke, pests like cockroaches and dust mites, pesticides, as well as pollutants generated outdoors, such as particulate matter that infiltrates buildings, are known to exacerbate and sometimes cause the onset of asthma. These hazards lead to asthma attacks, they require rescue medication, and also cause mistakes at school and work, reductions in performance and productivity, emergency healthcare, hospitalization, and even death. With our partners across the federal government, including the National Institutes of Health, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the scientific community, nonprofits, and healthcare systems, EPA is demonstrating that reducing exposure to environmental triggers can improve asthma control. In this respect, EPA is helping to lead the federal effort to promote interventions that reduce indoor air hazards in homes, schools, and other buildings where Americans spend 90% of our time and where we encounter most of our lifetime environmental exposures. As technical experts on the built environment and health, EPA staff has contributed significantly to the evidence-based grounding of our understanding of the role of the environment and in-home interventions in comprehensive asthma care. Through non-regulatory programs and partnerships, EPA is working with a particular emphasis on reaching low-income communities to ensure that people with asthma, their caretakers, schools and childcare providers, healthcare providers and payers understand how to improve indoor air quality, as well as the medical, public health, and economic consequences of not taking such actions in order to control asthma. And to make real change and improve the lives of people with asthma, EPA is working to equip all asthma stakeholders, from the individual to state and community-based healthcare, housing and school systems, to carry out straightforward and proven technical environmental solutions that create healthier indoor environments for people with asthma. Let me now talk about our work to expand sustainably financed access to home-based asthma interventions for all Americans. Currently, EPA is focused on expanding sustainable access to in-home asthma visits with environmental interventions in an effort to reduce persistent disparities in both access to environmental services and asthma health outcomes, in particular for low-income and African-American and Hispanic children. EPA is leading cross-sector initiatives to promote health equity by building and supporting capacity in communities to deliver high quality environmental asthma care, including expanded access to home visits and interventions for children with the worst asthma outcomes. For example, Medicaid spends more than 10 billion annually to treat asthma in children and adults. More children with asthma than children without asthma have healthcare coverage through Medicaid or the Children's Health Insurance Program. EPA is working with interagency federal, state, national, and community partners to expand healthcare reimbursement for tailored home environmental asthma interventions, including through Medicaid for disproportionately affected communities. To sum up, EPA expects that as capacity and sustainable funding to deliver high quality asthma interventions continues to grow, tailored care will reach more people who need it to reduce disproportionate environmental asthma burden. And in doing so, asthma outcomes and equity will improve together. EPA is committed to improving both public health and health equity by addressing the environment as a key driver of disease 
to prevent disproportionate environmental burden before it predetermines any person's health outcomes. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you, Alejandra. And again, thanks to the EPA for all that you are doing. Also tomorrow evening, uh, we will be hosting the EPA Asthma Leadership Awards, Excellence in Leadership of Asthma programs. And so please come back and join us tomorrow evening after we make our visits all day virtually. Um, we're going to reconvene tomorrow evening and celebrate together. And we'll learn more about those key programs and the uh, really best practices from the EPA uh, funded programs throughout the U.S. Now I'm going to invite Dr. Leroy Graham, who is a pediatric pulmonologist and the medical director of Allergy and Asthma Network's Not One More Life Trusted Messengers program to share with us a bit about this important project and the way that Not One More Life and Allergy and Asthma Network is reaching into the community during the pandemic. Dr. Graham? Hello, this is Dr. Leroy Graham of Not One More Life. I'm the founder and medical director. And uh, Not One More Life is in partnership with our constituent organization, Allergy and Asthma Network, to present the Trusted Messengers Project, which I'll discuss with you today. Well, first, uh, the background of Not One More Life. Not One More Life started as a novel approach to asthma care. We did programs and continue to do programs presented in partnership with communities of faith or other validated community partners local schools and other validated community partners have been instrumental in us reaching the targeted community. Typically our presentations include a short didactic presentation followed by a spontaneous question and answer period. Our participants are screened by validated, in this case a modified Junimer questionnaire and spirometry. Subsequent to that, pulmonologists, allergists, or primary care providers so trained uh, as volunteers review the results for the participants. Very importantly, we provide feedback to the primary care provider and or specialty providers already involved in the patient's care. In this way, we enhance rather than disconnect or undermine the basic relationship with their proximal providers. We also provided access to specialty care via community pulmonary clinics in Atlanta. And when we travel about, we find similar resources for the populations where we do expansions. Key to this is telephonic follow-up at 1, 3, 6, and 12 months. Well, Not One More Life, uh, a few years ago, was incorporated in the Allergy and Asthma Network, which is our home, uh, supports us, aids us in grant uh, solicitation, securing grants and management. And this has allowed us to really expand our mission and very timely so in the context of COVID-19. We drive community engagement through, again, once again, patient educations, a vigorous communication campaign and using trusted messengers. As you see on the left, my good friend and colleague, um, Montel Jordan, former R&B star turned minister. He and I did a, a very uh, good program, I think, by its receipt, uh, talking about COVID and plain talk at a community level, especially gearing up to the black community where there was a lot of vaccine hesitancy and a lot, a lot of uncertainty born out of prior mistreatment by the medical community. But what we did in that, we wanted to empower lifestyle changes and healthy behaviors through education. We address the barriers to care for at-risk patients with chronic illness, as has been described in COVID-19. We translate this into patient data insights into personalized solutions for patients, kind of on the ground where we can do. We also sponsored a number of programs in partnership with the communities of faith around Atlanta, most notably, again, Ebenezer Baptist Church, the home of Martin Luther King, where we did screening and assessment early on for chronic conditions that had been associated with disparate morbidity and mortality attributable to COVID-19. We connected patients to patient assistance programs. We gave out personal protective equipment. As we have morphed in subsequent visits, we have tried to ally on ourselves with people that can do vaccine because of the important issue of vaccine hesitancy within this community. We had an enduring project in that we used accelerated digital innovation to reach out, to give, give integration to the program, and to solicit insights from our patients or our participants going forward. This has been wildly successful. We have done it now in three communities in Atlanta, and we look forward in the near term to taking this elsewhere in the United States. So the Trusted Messengers Project is this, this, that. It is basically taking our core values of Not One Life Allergy and Asthma Network and empowering the community by utilizing the already established trust of trusted messengers, most notably churches and other validated community partners. 
So I thank you today. I look forward to bringing Trusted Messenger to communities around you or your organization might assist us in, in documenting or, or pointing us towards such communities. It's been my pleasure pre uh, presenting you today and I hope you will engage us in our Trusted Messenger effort. This has been Dr. Leroy Graham and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Graham. And I'm going to share our Trusted Messenger's hero video in just a moment uh, to give you an overview of exactly how this actually was uh, executed on the ground. And then I'll talk a bit more about where we go from here in 2022, 2021 and 2022. Trusted Messengers is an allergy and asthma network project bringing testing, education, and care to often overlooked communities. The people that got together to come here to be able to make sure that we're healthy, uh, to make sure we're making the right advances, not just uh, uh, for our health, but also for our, our wellness, and to put all this together, I think was a, a very, very big deal. From the time I pulled up the gate, I was welcome. They walked me through the process. They made me feel very comfortable. The people who are driving through uh, to be tested, some are essential workers, some are families and our community lacks those resources. An event like this makes me feel good because it uh, lets me know that someone actually cares about my community. For the um, African-American community, we are predominantly affected health -wise. We're We're in those fields where we are exposed. Put all this together to have free testing. They were educating me what I need to know about my body, which made me feel comfortable that I'm on the right track. To be able to help us stay healthy, and do the things that we need to do to be able to thrive as a community. So I love the fact they're just not helping me, but they're helping others as well, and they're helping generations to come. To have uh, uh, no insurance needed. My parents are uninsured, like so many other Americans. So for the fact that I was able to come, and it's a free service. We all have an opportunity to come together uh, to do something that's going to affect us all as a community, I think is super, uh, it's super important. It's essential. This is the epitome of serving your, your community, you know? So thank you guys. Yes, yeah. the doctor even thanked me for coming, but I want to thank them for the service. We thank you for your time, really, from my heart. The end of each event is only the beginning. Trusted Messengers connects communities to long-term follow-up and education to support life. Thank you so much for uh, watching that video. Hopefully it spoke to you. Um, as well, I wanted to share with you a bit about what we're going to be doing in 2022. We'll be taking the model of trusted messengers um, that we performed in 2020 and early 2021. We tested well over a thousand patients. And then we entered um, the high risk patients living with uncontrolled asthma or COPD into an asthma coach program. And we coached over 70 patients for a number of weeks um, that actually just concluded at the end of March of 2021. And we're still continuing to follow up with those patients and, and certainly support them throughout the pandemic. Now we're going to be taking this program to six to eight additional cities uh, throughout the country. And so please visit allergyasthmanetwork.org, trustedmessengers.org to learn more about the program and the cities that we're coming to and how you may get involved as a volunteer. So as we come to the close uh, or to the final presentation of our day for Allergy Asthma Day Hill Briefing, um, I want to share uh, one more patient story because the truth is um, our work is not complete. And this is a patient story that I think uh, will hit each of us right in our hearts because it's unfortunately the story of a family who has experienced great loss. So many times we don't stop and think about who in our community needs to be aware of the importance of allergy or food allergy or asthma. And the testimony that you're going to hear from Thomas Silvera absolutely reinforces why we still have work to do. And until there are no more families that experience the loss of the Silvera family, we will continue to strive towards that goal and host events like today. So Thomas, please join me and share your story at this time. Everyone, my name is Thomas Silvera. I am the co-founder and CEO of the Elijah Alabee Foundation. And today I'm here to share my story 
and the impact that has been created around my life, my family's life, and what we have done um, together in a community uh, with many who suffer with food allergies and asthma. So a little bit about myself. Um, I was raised in a very poor neighborhood growing up. Um, I was premature. Um, I'm a, a, a fraternal twin. Um, we were both preemies. Um, I was I weighed about uh, 3.5 pounds. And from that point on, I guess I kind of like created a snowball effect with my health in terms of like suffering with seizures, having an you know, undiagnosed respiratory disorder, and so forth. And as I got older, living in these unpoverished areas, the communities were definitely not that um, environmentally friendly, especially for those who had asthma. So I was in and out of hospitals all my life. Um, I also lived in the hospital from age 12 to 19, graduated from the school there up in Valhalla. And, you know, just in my life, you know, I've, I've, I've just been struggling with asthma and come to a point where I was able to manage it properly, um, especially working with the right specialists. But to kind of like fast forward to right now to give you a more in depth of why I'm actually here today, um, basically to talk about the patient focus and advocacy. Um, so in November 3rd, 2017, my youngest son, Elijah, was attending his daycare, which was um, which was less than a week um, when this happened. Um, he was attending his daycare in New York, and an educator had um, given him a food that contained an allergen that he was um, severely allergic to. And although them knowing about his severe allergies, um, um, they failed to have mentioned it to my wife when they called her. They didn't call not one. We had rushed him to the hospital, and soon after he had passed. I was at work at the time when that happened, and receiving that phone call is not a phone call any parent wants to receive. I thought it was, you know, I thought he'll be fine. It's, it's just his asthma. And I get there and come to find out it was he was in anaphylactic shock, and it was already far, far gone. Um, with the multiple body systems coming to effect. He had multiple rounds of epinephrine that didn't save him. Um, and I didn't know what to do from that point on. It was either, it, it became a very mental challenge, not just for me, but for my wife and for my entire family. Um, for his brother, Sebastian, you know, who sees him as his best friend and you know, not knowing that he woke up and wasn't able to see his brother again. So that was one of the challenges that I have to deal with on a daily basis is because he still doesn't know what really happened, even as many times as we explained to him what had happened and explained to him about grief. Um, that is a very challenging thing, especially when it comes to a young child. And that's one of the importance of why, you know, these panels and these, these discussions and getting legislations passed um, is so vital for the food allergy community and beyond. You know, from that point on, my wife and I, we we were just like, just mentally just drained and emotionally and physically. And we, even with family and friends trying to like aid in our help and helping us trying to like push through. You know, it's funny that my wife, you know, she had mentioned something to me. She was, she was like, we need to do something. We need to, do something fast and create some type of a change. So even in her grief, she did her research and everything and noticed that there was a, a, a lapse in the legislative system when it comes to the anaphylactic policy in schools and noticed there wasn't a, a policy in place for children in childcare. So and that's where the wheels would turn and we reached out to several organizations for their assistance and they have jumped on board like with no questions asked and help us, you know, put to some put something together that will put guidelines and protection for children in school. And with this, you know, we you know, we worked hard and hand in hand with local politicians, with um, organizations, and we were able to move this legislation forward and swiftly in the way we wanted, where there were mandates, not voluntary guidelines, but mandates in New York State. And we had a law passed, Elijah's Law, in 2019, which was passed in the Senate and the Assembly in early in that year, 
and signed by the governor in September of 2019. So that that you know many of us is like how how are you able to get this this bill passed? It's about passion. It's about grassroots. It's about persistence and never giving up, um, especially when it comes to advocacy and when it comes to something that you're very passionate about. Whether it's a legislation, whether it's something that has to do with a restaurant, whether it's has to do with a school, your family or your friends, being an advocate and being vigilant in what you want to instill in your community, in your family, is so important because you're providing the information that will keep your child or that person safe. And then giving that information to those family members and friends in the event they need to save your child or yourself from an anaphylactic uh, event. You know, it's, 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 you know, this story I, I tell so many times to so many people, and no matter how many times I tell this story, it's always like the first time I'm telling it because I get so choked up because, you know, I, I'm, I'm living a life that my son could have lived, you know, but, you know, it was taken away from him at such a young age, at the age of three. You know, so what we're doing is to instill the legacy, not just for our son, but also to put in protection for young children now and in the future. Um, and that's why we have to continue fighting so hard, fighting hard to create change, fighting hard to create lasting, impactful change. Because with only one voice, we can make some of a difference, but with many voices, we can make a world of difference. And I think and that's one of the key focus of why we need to keep pushing and pushing and pushing with the fact that I've been passed by so many people being involved and lending their voices and, and creating that chain. And that's why that was able to get changed and getting these uh, politicians and these congressmen and everyone to hear you, to hear you and hear that sounding heart that resonates within and how passionate you are that you want to keep your child safe and, and so many others, millions of people. And that's why with what we do as a family, we do it. We, we stand with everyone. We stand with everyone to create change. I want to be that voice for you. I want to send out that email. I want to send out that letter, that letter that you want to create change in restaurant, create change in a school, create change at a, a community center or wherever it may be. You know, that's what the community is about. It's helping each other. And, you know, and sometimes things could be hard, but they said the strongest swords are forged in the heat. And I think with with all that being said, you know, being an advocate for yourself and just moving forward and and just taking taking that chance to create change, and um, it's it's so vital and so important, you know, to be to be an advocate for change is like we 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 have to understand what steps that needs to be taken. You want to be passionate about it, so whatever it is that you're interested in when it comes to food allergies or asthma. You have to hone that in, do your research, put together something so when you do approach the right people, the right legislators, and you want to make sure you get the right legislators involved, those who are involved in public health, those who are involved in, in child care, in education, or wherever they may be, but they have to be along those lines so they can be, get a better understanding of what you're trying, the message that you're trying to convey to them. Because um, you don't want to bring it to a legislator that only focuses on whether it's Greenpeace or whether it's um, you want them to focus on public health policies. And that's where the biggest change is at. And then getting others on board. So you have to do your due diligence in terms of grassrooting, getting other legislators to sponsor and work hand in hand with your local politician, whether it's your senator or your assemblyman, whichever representative that you're working with, you have to be on, on top of them to make sure that what you're looking to get done is actually getting it. And I think that's one of the key things is like you can never leave it in the hands of the local politics because they have so many other projects that are working on. So you always got to make sure you're on top of them. You know, the same way you're diligent and you're vigilant and advocating for your child or yourself at restaurants or at schools or anywhere else, that is the same way you have to be with your local officials as well. Um, it's important to, to stay the course, stay focused, never give up, always think about the drive, um, get, you know, and focus on where you get your information at as well 
make sure that they have reputable sites um, from so many uh, sites like Aspen Housing Network where they have a bevy of information that they can provide to you um, at a simple click. Thank you. And it's just it's just so important that you know we can't let, let another tree loss due to someone in the system knowing even even knowing that they have the tools and the right information and that's why education is so key education and creating awareness and training and proper training is so vital that we want to provide a safe space for children and for everyone that's coming in the educators being trained on top of knowing how to handle an emergency swiftly having um, children be a voice for themselves and being advocates for change you know i know the youngest populations are very vulnerable some who are very vocal who can actually speak and there are some that still are having their time in, in learning the process so it's, it's like how do we create that environment for your child to be safe and that's you have to be there make sure that your your presence is known even though when you're not there it's important and um it's you know again it's like i, I be emotional saying this a lot my son's life was taken due to a negligence and the life that he had would have and the life he would have had with my family have changed the trajectory of how and where we do what we're doing today and i want you all to know that no matter what you do never lose sight of your passion and your focus to create it because it will make all the difference and stand your ground create that grassroots movement and just be patient and stay focused and sorry because we can't uh, we can't lose another life another child's life or anyone's thank you thomas again uh, our hearts go out to the silvera family as they continue to um live with grief and and again unfortunately their story is not the only one that we've heard from here at the network of those that have been um lost due to allergies asthma and related conditions over the last year but we appreciate the way that you've taken the tragedy and used it to advance the policy in your state of new york elijah's law has already been passed and how it's going to spread throughout our country and for the work that you're doing um, in the state level and the federal level so again from the state capitals to capitol hill it's the voices of you our advocates that are being heard we cannot say thank you enough to those of you who have joined us today to continue to advance Allergy and Asthma Day on Capitol Hill. As we go from this place today, we will prepare to have hundreds of visits with federal decision makers in the next 36 hours. We hope and pray that these decisions will continue to advance the policy priorities that we shared at the outset of our time together today. Again, we could not do this without each of you as individual advocates whether you're patients, healthcare professionals, industry partners, or just concerned stakeholders within our community. We are so grateful for all that you're doing to shape public policy and to advance the mission. We do hope and pray that someday we'll be able to end the needless death and suffering due to these conditions. But until that time, we'll continue to work together to breathe better together and so again thank you to each of you and to the supporters and to our co-host the american college of allergy asthma and immunology and also to the staff of the network for making this a successful event we wish you all well <laughs>